About a year ago, my daughter was heading off to college and I invited her to sit down and, and I wanted to go through journals that I had kept of her since her birth. And we were reading, reading them and we came upon a, a, uh, an entry that I had made four years prior where she was entering her freshman year in high school. And on that particular day, I was filming at a school where they celebrate Prairie Days. And on that day, the kids dress in period clothing and learn various things of that time period, like make, making maple syrup. And in the room I was about to film in, they were quilt, going to teach quilting. And there were four women sitting, and the children were gathered around them. And the teacher stood and introduced all but one of the women. And immediately, one of the women from the group stood and said, and this is my sister Mary. She'll be joining us today as well. She sat back down and they continued to teach the, uh, the quilting class. Uh, when I left that day, I had had their names and I made the entry into my journal and uh, with an asterisk uh, that they were sisters, that Kathy was the sister to Mary and she stood in her defense to introduce Mary. Uh, and Mary wasn't going to stand at that moment to introduce herself. So as I'm telling my daughter this story and having two daughters, I see the incredible bond that sisters have and I wanted to do a story on sisters. I, I didn't know what and I said there's a there's a great story there. there. There is a story of incredible love and compassion and dedication. Just at that moment when Kathy stood, she didn't have to but she did. Did it matter to the children? No. Why the teacher didn't introduce her? I don't know. So my daughter said, Dad, you need to do something. So the next day I called one of the women on the list that was in the quilting group and the following day we had a lunch with the, the, the women from the quilting group and it was, Mary was there and Kathy was there. And I told them what transpired that day and I wanted to do a story. Now these are very guarded, uh, guarded women, guarded sisters and pr very protective of Mary. And Subsequently, I met the third sister, Nora, and the three sisters have a bond that is not just special, but, but incredible. It's, it's a bond that my daughters have, and I've witnessed it. So, as we started to film, and I'm sitting behind the camera, and they start to tell their story, I realize that it is a bigger story than the sisters, that it is a story about parents and the parents of Mary and Nora and Kathy, Mr. and Mrs. Fisher. And it is truly a love story, how Mr. and Mrs. Fisher have reached into the future and given to these three daughters uh, a way to live, a way to really respect one another. <clears throat> to care for one another and to believe in each other. So I had to tell this, not just the sister story, but the story of the parents, uh, their, their pain, their struggles, their life. And that's what I did. My mother said she didn't cry because she knew and it was just a confirmation of what she knew. My father was crushed. He just broke down and just wept uncontrollably. In 1957, children with a disability were taken to an institution. Your family doctor says, do this because you'll harm the rest of the family. This child will never, I mean, they were told, she will never know you, she'll never walk, she'll never talk, she'll never have feelings, she'll never be anything more than a vegetable. You know, why, why put any effort into her? You have two children, don't worry about it. But if you put a normal person 
as a baby in an institution, I don't think that they could come out and be okay either. It's just, if you don't have love and support, you can't become the person who you were meant to be. Mary was born um, May 21st, 1957. I was nearly 10 years old. I don't really remember a whole lot except, you know, we were kind of like excited about a baby being in the house, but I had my own agenda being outdoors running wild. Um, the day my mother went into labor and she called my dad home from work, so father came home, took mother to the hospital. My sister Nora, who was four, and I went over to Aunt Ruth to stay. While she was in the hospital, I stayed next door with, at my aunt and uncle's house. I was kind of troublesome because I wouldn't stay there at night, so my dad would have to come over and um, bring me home for dinner and have me sleep at home. But then in the morning, I go back to their house because at that time, mothers were in the hospital for two weeks when they had their children. And so my cousin Sandy came over in the evening because dad had called their house to say that the baby had been born. Her pregnancy was absolutely normal, no problems. The delivery was absolutely normal. And um, the doctor said, she's a fine, healthy little girl. They never said anything. The nurses never said anything. Devastated when they found out. I know my dad was. My mom said she knew immediately after Mary was born that there was a problem. She just didn't know what it was. And my dad kept out hope that everything was perfect because it would be. His other two children were, so why wouldn't Mary be? She knew that they knew because you were in the hospital for a couple of weeks, but Mary was always the one that they fussed over the most. They put her hair in a little barrette. They had the cutest blanket on her. Um, you know, and my mother said her muscle tone was different than that of other newborn babies. My mother said she, she's quite sure that her doctor knew, but felt bad and didn't know how to tell her and so they kept going to other doctors to get a diagnosis. And her doctor never did he give any indication of what was wrong. In fact he almost led her to believe it probably was a muscle problem, perhaps a spinal problem. My father would go like, no don't say anything's wrong with her, we're going to take care of it. Um, did my parents express fears for Mary's future? Yes, and probably all of her life. Um, but and when in 1957, children with a disability were taken to an institution. Your family doctor says, do this because you'll harm the rest of the family. This child will never. I mean, they were told she will never know you, she'll never walk, she'll never talk, she'll never have feelings, she'll never be anything more than a vegetable. You know, why, why put any effort into her? You have two children, don't worry about it. And they considered that point of view because they didn't know anything else. And so I know they looked into places and they were horrified by some. Some are just, oh man, in 1957, institutions were ugly, and they, they couldn't do that. If she'd been institutionalized, she'd be different, but if you put a normal person as a baby in an institution, I don't think that they could come out and be okay either. It's just, if you don't have love and support, you can't become the person who you were meant to be. You know, you say, what is a disability? And yes, Mary has a defined disability. And she knows that she's different. She knows that people stare at her at times. But 
most of the time she's just quite confident of who she is and what's going to happen and she just got her life planned and she's just okay with that. And some places weren't too bad but when you were 16 you aged out of the program and then you're like my mother would say well, what do we do with Mary then? She won't really know us. She won't have been part of our family. What do we do with her then? And they, they tr looked at places, but they didn't know what to do. They, they just, every time they'd think they'd have an answer, they didn't, they didn't like it. And so it just became easier not to make a decision and to keep Mary at home. And that just became what it was. Mary was at home because we would love her and protect her and she'd be safe. And then by the end of summer they knew and had a name for it, although they didn't know exactly what it would entail. So my parents went into Madison, Wisconsin to the university hospitals and were told immediately what was wrong with her. My mother said she didn't cry because she knew and it was just a confirmation of what she knew. My father was crushed. He just broke down and just wept uncontrollably because he wanted to take care of everything. He wanted to make everything right and this was something he could not take care of. Um, my mother said she knew that as long as she had her husband, my dad, they could do anything together. My father would hold her and rock her and rock her and say, no, she's a fine little girl. Look at her, she is a beautiful little girl. There's nothing wrong with her. And he would just hold her all day and rock her and read to her and sing little songs to her. And she was a very cuddly, adorable little girl who we all adored. My father had um, pulled himself together because in 1957, fathers didn't show that they had any weakness. They were to take care of their families and they were the strong ones. And that was something my father felt very deeply in his bones, that he was the caretaker and this was his responsibility. Um, he just did not know where to turn to or how they could do this. But my mother said, she's a baby. I can take care of a baby. Uh, we'll deal with whatever we have to deal with together as it comes up. Um, I do not, I remember them telling us that she would always need to be taken care of. My mother said that I cried at that time. I don't really recall that. But I do remember her saying that she has special needs. She'll never be uh, like your sister. She'll never be like your cousin. She's always going to need to have us take care of her. has sleep apnea and uses a CPAC machine to help her get quality sleep. There. Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? What you gonna do today? Today I could be with Kathy. And I have to keep telling myself it's Mary's life and it's not a sad life. You look at Mary and she's full of joy, she's full of life, she's full of energy, she's always talking about all the friends in her life and who she's mad at. Good. Gotta get these all in the right She receives 24-7 support. She's at work Monday through Friday from about 9 to 3.30. 
And other than that, when she's at home, she has somebody with her. The reason for that is not that she would do anything destructive, but she would not know how to take care of herself if an emergency arose. So her life to her is full. In her eyes, she's beautiful, and no one's going to dispute it because she is beautiful. Now, Tuesday is a very special day for Mary because she has a job in the community. It's um, fairly difficult for the sheltered workshop to find outside employment for their people. Um, but Mary has found a job in the mornings at the Chamber of Commerce and she does cleaning there along with a job coach. She loves this job. This is the highlight of her week's work. She considers this her important work. You're going to see Mary in pants. Mary does nev never wears pants. She wears rings on both every finger. She wears at least three bracelets and three necklaces at all times. She is the height of fashion and she's never dressed unless she has on a vest. But Tuesdays when she works at the community center she has to wear pants for her cleaning position. And you can be sure that the moment uh, she gets home, at least eight rings, three bracelets, three necklaces, and a dress will go on her for the rest of the day. Center tonight, or this afternoon. Okay. Okay? Okay. And, and she doesn't have to bring lunch, or she's supposed no. to? No. No. Okay. That's it. Yeah. What are you going to do at the depot? Work for my way. Work with Myra. Do you know what you're working on? Yeah. What do you do? Um, take the papers out. Take the papers out. Yeah. Uh huh. And stuff. And where do you baskets. put the papers? In the basket. Oh, okay. Into and the trash basket. In a, yeah, mm -hmm. trash basket. Mm hmm And I work um, like um, dust to the walls, the bathrooms. Uh huh. And then I can dust. Where do, what do you dust? Anyway, lots of them. Oh, there's lots of things that need dusting. Yeah, okay. and clean the sink. And cleans the sink it's out? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And scrub the floor. Oh, yeah. Gotta scrub the floor. So when you leave, is it nice and clean? Yeah. Does it smell good when you leave? Yeah. Good. Doesn't she? Yeah, uh, yeah, she does. She's star quality. <laughs> yeah. And that's how she gets to work. Uh, the driver comes and picks her up every morning, takes her to work, and brings her home in the evening. And then she gets from the Mark Center to her job at the community center once a week. So there's always somebody available to take her where she needs to go. We're going over to meet Mary at the Mark Center where she works. Um, the Mark Center is the Madison Area Rehabilitation Center. They um, look for work for the developmentally and physically disabled, uh, collating, putting things together. They go out to the community and look for jobs that they can bring into the Mark Center to do. So there's different things at different times. Um, I'm not sure what Mary's doing at the present time, but she does a lot of collating, uh, like flyers, putting pieces together, putting the tops on medicine cabinet 
or medicine medicine jars. Open it up and find the staples, is that right? Yeah. When you find the staples, then you know you're in the right place? Yeah. Okay, and then this one goes first, and then the envelope on top. Remember. Set your done ones over here, okay? You'll be all set. You're already talking about coffee this morning. Oh, yeah. Remembering exactly how it doesn't need much help from me, do you? When you get done with those 50, we have 50 of a different brochure if you want to do it. Okay. Mary, you want to talk about what you're doing? Yeah. yeah. What are you doing? Um, so with the papers. How is it going? Good. Good. And open up. Get them all organized, right? Yep. Great job. Yeah. The other collating, but you could do it after lunch if you want to. You're going to leave with your sister? Are you guys going out to lunch? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That'll be fun. You can just finish up this then and you can do the other one tomorrow. Okay. All right. That sounds like fun. Work yeah. hard? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Work, work really hard. Work you up a sweat. always work hard, don't you? Yeah. Did you work up a sweat? Uh-huh. I already got it out. What do you remember about Dad? Dad was very handsome. He was very handsome. And I love him. He's a wonderful dad. He was a good person. And what did he do with you? We played. You played? Did he teach you to dance? To dance. What TV show did you watch and dance? Do you remember? He would be around. He, he whirled you around? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what TV show were we watching where we danced? Lawrence Welk. Lawrence Welk. Every Saturday night? Every Saturday night. What would we do on Saturday night? Do you remember? I liked the polka. You liked to polka with Dad? Yeah. And waltzes. And do waltzes with Dad? Yeah. And did Dad teach you to play some games? We play games. Do you remember what he built for you in the basement? Something. A, a jumping, yep, a trampoline for Trampol jumping. And a hula hoop. And a hula hoop. Mm hmm. Sometimes when we're out together, like at the zoo or at a store, and you'll say to me, How come he's staring at me? Yeah. How, do, how does that make you feel when people look at you? I feel sad. You feel sad? Do you think they're looking at you because they don't like you? Or why do you think they're staring at you? You like to stare at Connie. They like to stare at Connie too, your roommate? Yeah. And why do you think that is? I don't know. But it makes you feel sad? I love Connie a you, lot. You don't think they're people that like you? I don't think so. You don't think they like you? Do you think they're afraid of you? I'm afraid. You're afraid, huh? Do you think they're going to say something mean to you? Sometimes. Her time period really is 1950. And sometimes when I think about that, I think, well, you know, it's Maybe some of it is because she is our mother's clone. She thinks like our mother. She has the same mannerisms. She'll look at me when she's mad at me the same way our mother looked at me when she was mad at me. And uh, she kind of, and she loved our mother absolutely, totally. It, it was just a mutual devotion. and. As she was growing up, mother would be watching the um, 1950s, uh, 60s romantic comedy musicals, and I hated musicals, and my sister hated musicals. After all, we were children of the rock era. We were not going to be watching that. 
And so Mary was uh, watching that mo those movies with my mother and learning those songs, and they would sing the songs all the time. And we have a repertoire of CDs that I have to keep in my car at all times. Different moods uh, create different songs, and she'll look through the CDs every time we're in the car and chooses the CD that fits the moment. But always, at the end of the evening, when it's nearly, she, she has a point in town where she'll say, now, it's time. And that means that we have to cut to Andy Williams' May Your Day, May Each Day. And we sing that song until we hit her driveway and we finish the song in her driveway and that's the end of our day. And it's an absolutely perfect song to end the day with somebody you care for. May each day be a good day. May each dawn find you happy and gay. And may all of your days be as lovely as the one you shared with me today. With Mary, I was thinking that for the longest time, well, Mary was always my sister, but I think in my mind she was really my parents' daughter because they protected her so much and they didn't want us to feel like we had to be responsible for her. And so she just kind of became this person with my parents. It was mom and dad and Mary, always mom and dad and Mary. So we didn't really. Once especially we left home, Mary just became this, they were this threesome. And she really, she was more my sister when I was growing up because I'd have to take care of her and do things and we, we would play together. But then after I left home, she just became mom, dad, Mary. What did she used to do in the morning? My mom? Mm -hmm. She likes to have fun. She liked to have fun? Did she laugh at you? Laugh. She laughs with you? Yes. And did you sing with her? Yes. Tell me what songs you like to sing with Mom. What? What song did you like to sing? I like to sing like, um, Rain Dusk Get Down On Your Head. What is that one? Rain Dusk Get Down On Your Head. Oh, Raindrops. Oh, okay. Raindrops keep falling on, on my, my head. head. Two guys for his bed. I think I've got to go back and learn that song. That's yeah. all I can remember. Yeah. I remember the little teapot. Remember, I'm a little teapot? Yeah, teapot. Can you sing that one? Yeah, not really. Oh, <laughs> not really, huh? Which one can you sing? Hello, Dottie. Hello, Dolly. You and Mom like to listen to musicals, watch musicals on TV? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, hello, Dolly. Well, hello, hello Dolly. Dolly. It's, it's so, so nice. nice. Will you be back when you you'll be brown? You're working for swell balance. You're looking swell, swell balance. Dolly. It's coming back again. That was a good show, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. What, what videos do you like? I like Wicked Dude. 
Brigadoon. Uh huh. Good one. Musical. Yeah. What else you like there? Uh, that one's there, the Forrest Gump one. You saw yeah, that? Yeah, Forrest Gump. Yeah. yeah. That was that good? Oh uh, yeah. What did you like about Forrest Gump? That he's a good soul. He is a good soul, isn't he? Uh huh. I really love that. Uh, what are the musicals do you like? Um, like this is what is Fred Astaire. You, oh, Fred Astaire. Do you do you have any on Gene Kelly? Yeah, Gene Kelly. You do? Okay. So and then the, the family fan, band. Family band. Is that a good one? Yeah. yeah. And Doris Day Rock Hudson. Doris Day and Rock Hudson Pillow Talk. Pillow Talk. Yeah. Yeah, that's a funny movie, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's Doris Day too. Yeah, she's good, isn't she? Yeah, with the kids. Oh yeah. And that's Shrek. Shrek, funny. That's funny, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And Elvis Presley. Now, what do you like about Elvis? Uh, he's my favorite. You like his voice? I like his voice. He is a good singer. Do you have a favorite Elvis song? Yeah, I know them tonight. Oh yeah. Are you long? Do you know some of the the words to it? Yeah. Can you sing a little of it? Are you know them tonight? Do you miss me, me tonight? Yeah. Tonight. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that one too. Do you have a uh, a system, Mary, that you wear your uh, your necklaces. I mean, how do you choose what you're going to wear? Like today. Like today, this one right here. Today you wore that, and because you're wearing pink, or yeah. Would you have wore anything else with that? Oh yeah. What uh, now? How do you choose your? Uh, do you like the longer necklaces or the or the shorter necklaces? Uh, short necklace and long necklace. Right here. There's the shorter and longer ones. Okay. Yeah. They're pretty. They are pretty, aren't they? Do you have any more than that? Well, I went in the board trip. What's that one? On my vacation. Oh, okay. That's nice. And Terry gave me that for... Terry did? Yeah. Okay. And this one, too. Oh, very nice. Where do you keep your rings? Uh, in there. In here? Over here. You want to open that and we'll just take a look, see what you got in there? You want to open it like this. Now that is your, uh, your princess hat. Yeah, Terry, at the county fair. Oh, at the county fair? Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, you have a, every, every time I see you, you have one of these wonderful vests on. Thank Can you. you show me more of them? Sure. Yeah. How many do you think you have here? One. You two, have quite a few. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen? Fourteen, huh? Do you have a favorite vest? Oh, yeah. Of the, your favorite all-time vest, What? which one is that? Uh, is it in there? Yeah, right here. Oh, that one, that yeah. one, okay. Now, what is it about vests that you like? Why, why do you like wearing vests so much? Because I like vests. You like them? Uh-huh. Do they, do you have pockets in the vest? Oh, yeah. What do you, do you keep anything in there, or? Um, yeah. In the closet. Yeah. When is your birthday? May 21st of May. May 21st of May. So you just had a birthday? Yeah. What'd you do? Well, we had pizza and cake. Yeah. Was it good? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Chocolate cake or vanilla? 
Yeah. It, it was both? Yeah. My sister made that for me. Nice. Kathy? Kathy. Yeah. What do you like doing with Kathy? I like to have fun with her. Yeah? Do you? Are there any games that you guys play? Oh yeah, we got playing lots of games. Uh, what, what's, what are some of the games you play? Candyland? Candyland. Yeah. Is there a game called Princess? Princess. Yeah. You. <laughs> what happened with your bracelets? I don't know. How did you forget your bracelets? I always forget my bracelets. Why do you think that is? I don't know. There you go. We're good? Yeah. All right. Okay. Hi. Hugs for Joanne? Yes. <laughs> well, bye, Mary. You have a good, good day. Night. Take care, you guys. We will. And you have a good day, too, I Joanne. will. See you in two weeks. Or I see you next weekend. Next weekend? Yeah. Okay. That's my real weekend. Here. Okay. That's good. Of course, everyone thinks of sex when they think of love, which is to most people a very important component to um, a two-person love. Um, my parents' expectation for Mary and love was something that horrified them. They were so fearful that she would be taken advantage of. They were so fearful when she started menstruating and becoming able to have children. And there came a point in Mary's life when she was living with them when I believe those hormonal urges were coming to the surface. Um, she wanted to leave home. She wanted to explore life. She wanted to have a family. She wanted to have a baby. They had no place to turn. They had only themselves to turn to, to make decisions for Mary's life. And as you can well imagine, they had no clue what to do with this other than to be terrified and to watch her even more carefully. Uh, I'm sure that Mary probably feels some sadness about it because she would see, you know, Kathy get married, I got married, cousins got married. I mean, that's what you did. And she knew that that's what you did and she would want that for herself too. but we kind of dismiss her with, well, you have to take care of mom and dad. And so, you know, there was always someone in the family grouping that had never gotten married and would stay in with their parents. And she kind of accepted that rationale that, yeah, mom and dad needed her, so she would, she would sacrifice her own life to take care of them. So that's how it pretty much went, she knew. But I think she's had crushes over the years on different people. And I know, you know I've kind of dissuaded her with, oh, Mary, you don't want to get married. You know, having to take care of a house, it's a lot of work. And your husband won't pick up his shoes. He'll, you'll have to do his laundry and cook his meals. You don't even like to dust your room. And it'll just be a lot of work if you fall in love. And she, yeah, that's true. So she kind of knows that it's not gonna happen, but I'm sure that, you know, she would have kind of preferred to have fallen in love, but it, it didn't happen. And like I said, I, I know she's probably had crushes here and there, and uh, probably a few of them at the Mark Center. And, but she, she pretty much knows that, no, 
she and Connie are just going to live together and her husband's just a lot of work. Mary loves babies and would have always loved to have a baby. I would tease her and say, you know you've got to change diapers. And she's like, I would do that, I would do that, when she was probably in her mid-40s. Uh, she had fibroid tumors resulting in a hysterectomy. Somehow, when she had that hysterectomy, no one said a word, but she somehow knew this meant she couldn't have children. And she said, now I can never have babies. And I said, that's right. Now that she's living in a residential group, now she lives in a uh, duplex with a caretaker and a roommate, but there's about, oh, 30 or 40 people in town that are under the same uh, housing help group. So they get together frequently for dances, they get together for parties, they get together for picnics. So she does have this group of friends outside of work. You know, you sort of think you can only look at things through your own eyes. And so you become saddened. But when I look at Mary's eyes, she's happy. No, Mary has, uh kind of given us a, a new way to look at life. She um, has brought in people that we never would have met otherwise, people that give of themselves. And I, if it wasn't part of my family, I wouldn't be involved with it. And yet these people are, and they're really caring and thoughtful, and they, they just give of themselves. And it, it's been really an amazing journey, I think, for all of us to see that there's so many nice people in the world, and we might not have met them without Mary. You never heard them fighting or confused about, they, they just handled stuff. And I think they both did. They, they just knew that they were a team and they had to deal with this and life would go on and what else can you do? So one of the things that my mother did partly because of her love of children and partly because she thought it was for Mary's benefit was to take in foster children. So we always had two, three, four extra girls in our home and they would live with us for several years because of some trauma that was going on in their own family lives institutionalization was always in the back of my parents' mind. I think that was a heavy, heavy weight. A lot of dreams were shattered, but, you know, that's kind of life. Dreams get shattered and you just have to keep moving forward. And they, they both were good about that and, and giving us a family life, you know, and, and incorporating Mary into it. I don't think I don't know when it was I realized that Mary was different. She was just our sister. Mary lived with my parents um, until my mother was physically unable to care for her. They had her up until the time she was in her early 30s. Well, when my father was 79 and absolutely as healthy as anybody, golfed every day, loved life, had a good time. He went down to take a shower and died. That And mother went into immediate depression. Mother could do anything as long as she had her husband. To her, she had to have Mary because Mary was her reason to get up. Mary was her reason to make a meal. So she became dependent on Mary for a reason to live. We would talk to mother, but it was so negative that we did not pursue anything. Um, Mary was 
becoming depressed as well. Um, and they lived out in the country. They lived, mother never drove because she had a husband who drove. It was a very closed, sad house. And when mother was 87, she was 80 when her husband died. And when she was 87, she was walking up her driveway and a big truck backed into her. And she had a terrible concussion, was in the hospital the whole summer. At that moment, Mary left home. It was so abrupt. Um, it was like, it, I guess it happens with everybody. Until there's an emergency, you let things ride. My dad died, and then Mary kind of became our sister again because we had to help her more because my mother became so depressed, and it was hard for Mary to be in that house with my mom depressed, and Mary was depressed too. I mean, their whole life just blew up instantly, and so we had to take care of just mom and Mary now, and we had to really kind of help Mary especially because it was hard for her to lose my dad who just adored her and now to be with my mom who was depressed and Mary just kind of lost her life so we kind of became sisters again and then after my mom's accident then Mary totally became our sister she was part of the three of us I, I remember just being amazed by her because after my mom's accident, Kathy and Mary and I had to do everything together, go visit in the hospital and find nursing homes and rehab centers. I mean, it was just so confusing. And Mary was with us every step of the way. And I couldn't believe how she could accept it and, and just move forward with us. And her whole life blew up. I mean, she didn't have a, a home anymore. My mom was in the hospital. She couldn't live in the home by herself. And she just handled it so beautifully. She just, she was so happy, I think, to be our sister and to know that we would talk to her about what was going on with my mom's care and what it would mean to her. And she lived with me for I'm not, I don't remember, maybe six weeks or something, and she loved it. And, you know, we had to keep reminding her that it wasn't permanent because both Kathy and I were afraid that we would fall into the same trap that my parents had of not making a decision. And we saw what that can happen because eventually Mary will be alone, especially with Kathy and I both being older than Mary we'd have to finally make a decision for Mary, and so we kept telling her that. And she'd much prefer to have stayed with either Kathy or I, because that was family, and she was very into family. But she knew that her life was gonna change too, and she just went through it so well, and it was just really a joy to have her around, and to know that she was as concerned about what was going on as we were, and, and she helped us so much. I mean, she's a very caring and thoughtful person, and just, um, it, it really made it easier. I, I found that to be kind of strange, because I didn't expect that. I thought we would be helping Mary more, and yet she helped us because she just was so happy to be our sister and to be part of the decisions and to, you know, to go around with. She she just loved to to be with us during the day and to um, spend time with us. And even though her life had blown up and she went through more changes than Kathy and I did with this, but she was just okay with it because she was still with family. I really don't want her to have to go through my death. Even though I'm 10 years older than Mary, I've been so blessed with good health, and she is somewhat healthy, but she has 
um, physical problems. And so I think it's a legitimate hope that I outlive her. Um, I know that her physical well-being will be taken care of, but I don't think her mental well-being, her happiness, she would be crushed if I were to go first. She would not know where to turn to. She, of course, would turn to Nora, and Nora would be there for her, but they have a different relationship than Mary and I do. Much of it is because Nora is not as close physically. Um, would I like to see Mary pass before Kathy or I? Yeah, but then that's what my parents wanted too. That's what they hoped for. And just because nobody would love her and care about her as much as we do. And I, I suppose she would survive because what choice do you have? And she's surprised me over the years. But yeah, we'd, we would like to know that she was okay and not leave her in the world all by herself because Kathy and I are really the only family she has left. So it would be hard to know that we were gone and she was still here and having to cope all by herself. That would be a tough one. Well, our mother lived in assisted living after her accident for about seven years. Um, it was a very tough seven years. She was in pain most of the time. Um, she did not want to be alive. And I think she finally was able to will herself to start dying. Um, I remember coming in to see her. I came in daily to see her and I had Mary come in. We spent all day Saturday with her and then we would spend a couple of hours in the afternoon other days. And I came in the one, that one day and she said, well, I think I'm gonna die. And that's what she said to me every day. And my response was always, well, either hurry up and do it or we're going shopping. But this day was different. She was not really herself. And the, at the assisted living, the nurse said, I think she has a bladder infection, which is a very treatable thing. And my mother said, no, you're not going to treat me. And I said, let's call her doctor. And fortunately, she had been to see her doctor about a week before that, just for her regular checkup, and had been very honest with her doctor that she was tired and she wanted to go. So when the nurse called the doctor, the doctor said, we're calling in hospice, we're not giving her any medication. Um, so at that point, hospice came in and everything changed within an hour. And it was a wonderful, hospice is, as everybody knows, incredible. They made things so wonderful. They included the family and everything. But mother went down very quickly to somewhat com comatose, coming in and out. Um, we would be with her and she would come out for an hour at a time. This was towards about the 15th of May, I think. And Mary's birthday is the 21st of May. And when she would come out, she would say, what's the date? What's the date? And I would always tell her whatever the date was. And now I realize that she did not want to die on Mary's birthday. And she hung on and she hung on and we had the priest come in to give her the sacrament and he said, you have done everything you can, you've led a good life, feel free to go now. Um, Nora came in and said, everything's gonna be okay, don't worry about anything. I said it many times, 
Um, other relatives, friends came in to say goodbye as she was, would come out, but she would keep saying, what's the date? What's the date? And finally, I think it was on the 21st of May, Mary's birthday, um, we were planning a little party where she worked and Mary came in and talked to her for a little while and said, I'm going to my party at work now and I'll be back. And we left and had her little party at work, her cake and ice cream. And then we came right back and she was hanging on and mother said, what's the date? And we said, this is Mary's birthday, it's May 21st. And she said, happy birthday, honey. And then Mary said, held her hand and she kissed her and she said, mom, I'm okay. You can go to dad now. I will be okay. And mother just kind of did a little smile and went back under. The next day, May 22nd, I told, which was a Sunday, I told mother we were having a little party. No, I think it was a Saturday. I'm sorry, it was a Saturday. I told mother we were having a little family barbecue for Mary's birthday and everybody would be there. And we would come up to see her after we had our, our meal in Mary's party. And then we'd come up and have another party there so that she could see Mary's things. But she was really not awake enough to respond at all. So May 22nd, Nora and her husband Emery decided they would hit the hospital before they came to the party and then go back again. And I got a phone call from her just as we were getting ready to get in the car that mother had passed. She must have wanted to go when no one was there, but we were all together. And she knew we were all together and Mary's birthday was over. So she could now go and it would not be on Mary's birthday. And Mary remembers that every year on her birthday, she will say, and mom died tomorrow. Do you talk to your mom? I talk to mom every day. You talk to mom every day? I pray every day. And you pray every day and that help? Does that help you feel better? Yeah. And does mom ever come to you in your dreams? In my dreams. And what does she say to you? Mary, I love you. Mom, I love you.
Yeah, Connie. And what else do we like to do? What do you, what do you and Connie do? Oh, sometimes we had a fight. Had a fight? No. <laughs> you try to get Connie out of bed. Put that off. Yeah. I love my roommate. I love you too, Connie. Yeah. I love my roommate. Love the colors today. Thank you. So what'd you have for breakfast? Egg and toast and tea. Sounds like a good one. Mm-hmm. Now how long have you guys been roommates? About two years. No, it's been a lot longer than that. But it seems like two because it's such a good relationship, right? Yeah.